Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, how are you? This is the first of a series of lectures and presentations that we're, will continue throughout the years, hopefully, and this semester. On April 3rd, Lauren uh, Weidman, uh, the ex-correspondent of The Daily Show, is going to come. April 9th, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Colbert, not Colbert, <laughs> uh, a, a columnist from The New Yorker, uh, just wrote field notes from a catastrophe, and she's going to be coming as well. And once again, that's April 9th. It is my absolute privilege. And when I say privilege, I mean privilege to introduce to you today at Marlboro College, Elaine Brown. <laughs> Elaine Brown, as I noticed backstage and had heard, is a fantastic singer, <laughs> a songwriter, editor, activist, mother, author and speaker. Um, in 1973, Elaine Brown ran for public office in Oakland, and in 1974 through 1977, she was the leader of the Black Panther Party, emphasizing both education and free food programs. Just recently, Elaine Brown withdrew her presidential candidacy with the Green Party. The list of Elaine Brown's accomplishments is long and extremely inspiring. So I will only say a little bit to avoid taking up her precious time. But Elaine Brown is an advocate for prison reform and juvenile justice, the co-founder of the Mothers Advocating Juvenile Justice and the National Alliance for Radical Prison Reform, as well as the author of The Condemnation of Little B. Elaine is also the founder of Fields of Flowers, a nonprofit organization, uh, education corporation that focuses on the welfare and education of poor black students. Um, Elaine Brown is currently co authoring For Reasons of Race and Belief The Trials of Jamil uh, Al. I mean, formally, H. Rap Brown. Excuse my uh, lack of articulation. I'm just really, really excited about this. Um, I woke up shaking this morning, like, honestly. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it's good to have a reason to get out of bed finally. Uh, <laughs> uh, she is also completing the nonfiction book, uh, Melba and Alice Story of Black Love in Jim Crow America. Uh, both of these books are slated for publication in 2008. Um, she's also the editor of Messages from Behind the Wall, a collection of autobiographical essays by black prisoners in New Mexico um, that was published in February 2007. Um, after, she's going to be taking questions as well as uh, doing some book signing. Elaine Brown's a Taste of Power lit a fire inside of me. I don't want to be trite, but I have to be. The fire was only lit when I found the knowledge within myself. And I mean, her book helped me find my political voice. And Elaine Brown has dedicated her life to helping many people who do not have a voice find a voice. She has dedicated her life to social justice. <laughs> so I just want to thank her for coming and thank her for giving me the courage to find my own voice. Um, and I definitely recommend you read everything she has written, and also check out her two albums. <laughs> um, 
However, I don't want to take up any more time, so please put your hands together and give a huge warm welcome to Elaine Brown. Thank you. It's dark in here, huh? I, you can see me, but I can't see you. You know, <laughs> thank you very much, Amber. Um, We've had a good conversation in the little few minutes uh, that we have had to talk, and uh, she's been kind enough to give this uh, very inspiring, uh, to me, um, <clears throat> introduction. I appreciate it really very much. And um, so I was wondering, I said, well, you know, one thing, we probably get some people out because what, is, what else is there to do? But I understand there's a lot to do. Uh, <laughs> A lot to do, but I'm glad you came out for whatever reason. You know, it is cold out there, it's warm in here. Um, so I'm gonna talk for a period of time and then I'm gonna take some questions and answers. But when we get to the questions, I would appreciate the lights because I like to see who I'm talking to. You know, I'm paranoid, I'm from the old days. You know? <laughs> Everybody show me what you got, you know what I mean? <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, we're, we're talking these days in amazingly, amazingly a lot about change in America, that is to say, Barack Obama is talking about change uh, in America. You know, I, uh, a lot of people say, is he black, isn't he black? You know, meaning, I don't know whether because he has a white mother, doesn't have white, whatever. But um, I would say that he's, um, he's, not, he's not just black, which is what he'd like to say. <laughs> he's well, more than black, above black, beyond black, outside of black, almost invisibly black. <laughs> and. Um, so uh, in his, uh, in, his uh, in the tension that people are saying, well, should we vote for uh, a woman or a black? Um, I find it to be uh, absolutely curious because I'm trying to find out which one of these people is supposed to be the woman or the black because I don't see <laughs> what the point is. <laughs> so we got an invisible brother. <laughs> <and> <laughs> A lot of people tell me, well, you know, he's just doing that because he's got to get the whites and he wants to get all the things. I said, oh, so you're telling me that suddenly he's going to flip into a brother <laughs> and when come time if he gets elected? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> now, a lot of people are mad about this because they want to like Barack Obama because they're just looking for some kind of hope and change. You know, just, yes, we can. Shoot, Sammy Davis said that in a book many, many years ago. It was called, Yes, I Can, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so no, you don't even remember that. They just took, ripped that right off the page of Sammy Davis's book. So anyway, uh, and, and then we think about change coming with Hillary Clinton. I was just trying to figure out what kind of change that might be. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Bill Clinton's wife. <laughs> and that's just about all Hillary is, you know, really. Because we can't really think of her uh, as doing anything else. And what did she do uh, all these years? We just don't know. But we know what Bill Clinton did, and I'm going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> then we go to John McCain. Now, that's the really only interesting person running, because he's getting ready to introduce us to World War III. <laughs> <laughs> and while he's not of the elite cartel that's running this country, um, you know, and I could get into all of that in terms of, you know, the Bush, the Bushies and, uh, and, and the Currys, you know, a couple other folks in that little 1% that owns and controls the entire country. Um, the one thing we know is that John McCain, though, will carry water for these boys, you know, and that's who he is. You know, his father was a was an airline, I mean, an air pilot, a, a fighter jet, uh, flying fighter jets or whatever it was. And uh, I just want to say one other thing about John McCain, because I, I'm getting kind of annoyed by this constant profile of his about his heroic work and how he survived the Hanoi Hilton, the so-called the Vietnamese uh, uh, prison. Um, we forget that John McCain was flying uh, bombers that were bombing the Vietnamese people and killing them in large numbers. And we say, wait a minute, the Vietnamese had him. Oh my God, it was a horrible moment. Wait a minute, they didn't kill him. They, the man lived for those years. He came back, you know, and is now running for president of the United States. So, I mean, I don't know who's the ruthless person here. You killed all those people in Vietnam and you walked away. But in any case, we know that John McCain has already told us what the issues are, and he says it's not, we, he's not worried about the health care question, and neither, are the, neither is Clinton or Obama, because they're talking about health insurance. 
You know, they're not talking about health care. They're talking about how you're going to buy it. You too can have insurance. Can you imagine what the insurance companies are holding their breath on this one? How much money? Just imagine all the people of America having to have health insurance. This is, it's amazing, isn't it? So John McCain is not worried about health care. He's not worried about the economy. He said the issue here is Islamic terrorists. You know, that's some scary stuff, don't you? Wasn't there a little incident today in Times Square? Can I get a witness up in here somewhere? <laughs> Wasn't there some kind of little terrorist incident or something in Times Square today? And it's only the beginning. We haven't even gotten to spring. Oh, well. We'll be seeing how John McCain will be the man of the hour. We've almost forgotten about the Iraq war, haven't we? <laughs> the surge is working, isn't that what we're told? The surge is working. So I think this election is not about change. I think this election is about you can fool most of the people a lot of the time, you know. And people are like, well, I just don't know. Well, what else can we do? What have you been doing? Been voting between bad and worse. What has been the difference between now and then? Oh, we have change coming. But before uh, Barack Obama erases black people from history, <laughs> as he would like to do, and, from the, and, and that we're all, you know, we're all Americans, we're the United States of America, but before he does that, I want to say that, um, you know, he's kind of like in that Michael Jackson school of, it doesn't matter if you're black or white, we don't know, we don't know what, Michael, what Michael's supposed to be, but it doesn't matter if you're black or white, you know. Anyway, I think that we, I want to talk something about, and I know that the majority of people in Vermont, not to count here, are not black, but I think that the black experience is an important one for all of us to look at in terms of a measure of what, where this country is and where we want it to go. And that we don't speak about this. I understand that right now we're supposed to be the post-racial generation. I mean, not we, you. Um, I'm barely, I'm some other generation. I'm the old generation. But anyway, so, so we're, you, you guys are supposed to be the post-racial generation. And we're in a post-racial period. This is the new language of the day. And that means that we are not discussing race issues anymore. We're discussing something else. We don't know what we're discussing. As though discussing race issues is either tired or it's boring and or the most important part that it doesn't, racism doesn't exist so there's nothing further for us to talk about. That's the Barack Obama concept that we don't really have to talk about race anymore because racism isn't here. As a matter of fact, I think he said that 90% oh, of our uh, issues have been addressed at this point, meaning black people's issues. It's amazing. I don't know how you quantify that, but in any case, um, <laughs> He seems to be able to do it. And therefore, we're going to whitewash the history of black people. And we don't want to talk about black things, because if we do that, then we have to deal with some of the history that makes people so uncomfortable, which is why Obama makes everybody so comfortable, because they don't have to look back at anything anymore. But I, what I want to talk about in the title of my little talk, and it has been, which is the subtitle of my uh, last published book, which uh, is a Condemna Condemnation of Little B is New Age Racism in America. And somebody asked me this morning about whether I thought this had something to do, what, was I speaking about people who were, you know, using crystals, you know. Um, and, <clears throat> and in a way, I am, because what happens in, the, you know, at some point we started talking about mind and body and the connection, and we understand that connection. And we, we talk about things like, well, you know, we can control some of the things that happen in our lives if we eat better foods, if we don't smoke, if we don't do this. You remember there was a period when, well, you probably don't remember this, but it used to be, spray deodorant, <laughs> you know, like this, right? <laughs> and they said, well, if you use that, you're messing up the ozone, ozone layer. Now, all these chemicals <laughs> that are being produced by all these big companies, but I'm going to mess up the ozone layer. <laughs> And you know, and, and the recycling piece, well, we have to all do our part. Let's not use plastic bags. Let's do the bomb bombs are being dropped in Iraq. Let's get down to the stuff that's really messing up the planet, okay? <laughs> so, and that doesn't mean that this doesn't count, that we don't have some personal responsibility. But what happened is we began to think that it's your fault you have cancer because you don't eat your right vegetables, you know? If you just ate some carrots and broccoli, you wouldn't have cancer, as though carrots came, and it all came from, from a certain food, and that's not to count where the food's coming from anyway. And that would mean that we would have a problem if we lived in the hood, because you cannot be a vegan in the hood, you know? <laughs> you're not gonna get any fresh vegetables. <laughs> so I guess you're gonna have cancer. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so we started thinking that everything was an individual choice, you know? And it's really a matter of choice. You know how now we say, well, he chose to do that, as though you had chosen to come into this planet and into this world. You had anything to do with that. 
I learned that from Jamil Alamine recently that it occurred to me that I thought I would have control over so much and I found I realized that I actually have nothing to do with a whole bunch of things like how I even got here you know it was a surprise to me I thought I was so you know we were we were very arrogant in the 60s we thought the revolution was going to come in our lifetime and we were going to make it happen just because we suddenly woke up one morning and thought something was wrong as though nobody else had ever had this idea ever and ever tried to do anything so this whole new age concept and I put this to racism because this was another kind of way of, 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 of speaking about race in America. And, and I say it was inaugurated and inculcated by Bill Clinton, Hillary's husband. And in some cases, we might have called him Massa Clinton, but a lot of people called him, <laughs> a lot of people called him the first black president. You know, black people were actually running around calling him the first black president. I can never figure, I wasn't one of them, obviously. <laughs> so I guess I would make, huh? It was, it was Tony Morrison and it was uh, Chris Rock and a bunch of other Negroes running around calling Bill Clinton the first black president. So I guess if he was the first black president, that's going to make Barack, if he got to be president, which he won't, that's going to make him the second black president. <laughs> but in any case, black people thought he was the <clears throat> first black president. Many black people did, believe it or not. She just happens to be the one you heard about. But let me tell you, you'd be surprised how many people thought he was. They said, well, he understands us. You know, was he eating barbecue or something? I don't know what, you know. <laughs> he was a southerner. <clears throat> he was a southerner. He, he understood southern cuisine. That's about all I can say about that. <laughs> but anyway, when Bill Clinton was inaugurated, I knew black people were in trouble. And we were all fooled by Clinton because Clinton came on strong, you know. And plus, we had to deal with Bush, you know, at the other side. But Clinton said that he was going to have his inauguration by following in the footsteps of Thomas Jefferson. I said, oh, good God Almighty, it's over for us. <laughs> I knew something was wrong with getting a man in the White House that came from Arkansas. You know, something was, going, something was up when you're that close to Little Rock, Arkansas. So Clinton says, I'm going to march for Monticello. I'm going to go to Monticello, the home of Thomas Jefferson, whom I admire more than any other man. My middle name is Jefferson. And I'm going to march and walk from Monticello to up to D.C. in a caravan the way Thomas Jefferson did. And I knew then that it was all over for us. <laughs> Within less than a year, Bill Clinton let me know exactly what was happening and let us know, but a lot of people missed it. In November of 1993, he appeared in Memphis, Tennessee to give a speech there to the black, in the black church where Dr. King gave his last great speech of, of his life the night before he was assassinated. And he said, you know, when Dr. King said, you know, uh, I'm not fearing any man tonight, been to the mountaintop, seen the other side, know that we as a people are going to get there. I might not get there with you. Remember that speech? One of the great speeches of Dr. King, and he made many, but that was certainly memorable because it was the last one. And here's Clinton standing on this sacred spot, talking about looking out at all the blacks in the audience coming down, <laughs> coming down from the mountain to to greet the people and telling the people, he says, you know, I'm standing here and I'm looking at the conditions in black America today and I'm saying to myself, I wonder what Martin Luther King would say if he were alive today. He says, what would Martin say? And so Clinton is not gonna tell us because as though he would have known, known anything about what Martin Luther King might have said. <laughs> back in 1968 before he was killed. And Clinton says, I think that if Martin Luther King were alive today and he saw the condition of the black community, he would say, I died for your freedom, but look what you've done with it. And black people hung their head in shame. They said, you're right, Master Clinton. <laughs> we bad, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> so <laughs> we done something wrong here. He said, look at you. All that black on black crime, the white man's not killing you, you're killing yourselves. This is a specious argument, by the way, so don't buy into it, because you, you're going to end up being on the wrong side of this. <laughs> he says, you killing each other, you don't have any problem with a white man, now you have a problem with each other, you're killing each other, and what about all that breakdown of the black family? You can't even keep your families together. Your men are leaving, they say, oh, Lord, you... He's right, and then that bad, horrible Shaniqua and Chantanay and them having all those illegitimate babies out of wedlock and making everybody pay for it and not getting a job like the rest of us. Everybody said, that's it, you're right. You are right, we are wrong. And so Clinton said, so we're gonna have to address this. 
Now, I'm going to get back to that in a minute, but the first thing, and this is what I like to tell students, this is what my theme is, is that in order for us to come to correct conclusions, we have to have a correct analysis, don't we? And that we have to have an analysis based on facts, not on conjecture. I had somebody ask me last night, well, didn't I think that Condoleezza Rice did not think that Condoleezza Rice was better for the Palestinians now because she seemed to be late to them because as a black woman. I said, what are you talking about? I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> you can't even put Kenty cloth on Condoleezza Rice and turn her into a sister. Please, what are you talking about? Nobody believes Condoleezza Rice is black. Except for some women who want to celebrate black, uh, uh, women's history and put her name up there like she has something to do with it, you know? <laughs> Condoleezza Rice is, is, doesn't represent that. So, so Clinton tells us, he says, look, Dr. King said, I've died for your freedom. Wait a minute, hold up now. Let's have a correct analysis. Dr. King didn't die. He was, a, he was assassinated just as he was doing a very important piece of work. And it wasn't the Memphis garbage strike, sanitation worker strike. Dr. King was organizing. You know how we all talk about we love Martin Luther King. Nobody knows anything about him. Somebody he had a dream. Don't know what the dream was. Talk about some about some little children, black and white, holding hands, walking up a mountain. Whatever. We all we don't really know <laughs> what was the dream. We forgot. Okay. <laughs> Just remember he was nonviolent. That's all you need to know. <laughs> and so Clinton says, "I died for your feet." Wait a minute. He didn't die. He was assassinated, and he was in the process of organizing the poor people's campaign. Not only black people, white people, come everybody, or as we used to say in the church, whosoever will, let him come. He said, come on, we're going to Washington to cash our check. We want some guaranteed income. We want some guaranteed health care. And then the worst thing he said, we want a complete redistribution of the wealth of this nation. Not long after he said that, he was killed, you know what I mean? So I know you're not walking down into Washington, D.C., leading millions of people while I'm waging war in Vietnam. I know you are not messing with my country like that. Dr. King was gone. But here he's, so he's saying, Dr. King died for your freedom. So the second thing is, he died for our freedom and look what we've done with it. Well, that, that would assume that we had been free sometime after April the 4th of 1968. <laughs> and then we messed up freedom with these three big areas, this black on black crime and all this. Now. You guys, most of you guys weren't even born in 1968. Were never even, weren't even thought of. Maybe your parents were just, you know, you, 1968. But I was alive and an adult, too, <laughs> even though I would like to lie about my age. But it's hard for me to say I was in the Black Panther Party and still be 46, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I got to go with the truth. <laughs> I'm trying to lie about it, but it's catching up with me. So I was alive on April the 4th of 1968, and when I... And I went to bed that night after Dr. King was killed. The country exploded. Black people all over America just tore up America for days afterward. A hundred, hundred cities exploded. And we all, I went to bed that night. I was in California, so I was on Pacific time. <laughs> and I know, and we weren't free. And the reason I knew we weren't free is not because it was a subjective. If I didn't know anything else, Dr. King told us. He said, I've been to the mountaintop, see another side. No, we as a people going to get there. What is there? It's freedom. We weren't in the civil rights movement. We were in the freedom business. It was a movement for freedom, huh? And we knew we were not free on April the 4th of 1968 because that's the night or the night before April the 3rd, Dr. King told us. So when I woke up on April the 5th, nothing had really changed. Looks like black people were still in the same condition we were the night from the night before. And I even joined the Black Panther Party right after that and went forward for the next 10 years fighting for what I believe was black freedom of black people as well as others. So I'm trying to figure out at what point were we free that we had messed up this freedom between 68, 78, and 93 when Clinton was talking to us. And I concluded that the only thing that I could think of is that we must have been free sometime on the night of April the 4th. I went to sleep. I woke up, and I slept through freedom. That's all I can conclude. But let's talk about black-on-black -black crime. It says we don't have to worry. What's the real message? The real message is there's nothing wrong in this country. There's something wrong with you. You're not eating your vegetables. That's why you got cancer. You people are, are, are criminals. That's why you're dying. You're not dying for anything America's doing to you. There's something wrong with you. America is a good place. We, we, 
we've, dis we've resolved, Dr. King resolved the question of civil rights and human rights and all that. The problem now is you killing each other, having all these babies out of wedlock, you know, all of that. And around that same time, there was the theory of the super predator that started, started to be promoted by a group of people led by somebody like Bill Bennett. Remember him? The guy that gave us last year, if you aborted all the black babies, Amer crime in America would be over. This is the same guy, you know, he's on CNN and whatever else he's on. Bill Bennett, used to be the uh, Reagan uh, uh, Secretary of Education. I'm not making this stuff up, you know. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, it, it's a hard, a joke on us, you mean. <laughs> so Bill Bennett and a guy named John DiIulio uh, wrote a book called Body Count, in which they talked about how there was a new group, a wave of, of, of criminals rising up. It was like a new breed, you know, kind of gets into a genetic question, right? So it was a new breed of criminal. They were getting younger and younger. Of course, they were black, right? And the more and more people that were growing up in these neighborhoods, the more problems we were going to have, and there was going to be blood flowing through the streets of America if we didn't do something about these bad black boys. And they said that. John DiIulio wrote a piece called My Black Crime Problem and Yours. These boys weren't playing, and they created the kind of policy, uh, basis for policy. There was another guy, a guy named, who worked with DiIulio named James Q. Wilson, and he gave us the broken ring, windows theory of crime, and the broken windows theory is that there might not be crime, but there's the appearance of crime, and we have to shut down some things like all these nasty, uh, these prostitutes and these crackheads in our cities, and this is how the New Yorkers ended up uh, ended up uh, 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 electing Giuliani, even though the majority of New Yorkers are Democrats. Giuliani says, I'm going to clean up uh, New York. I'm going to make it better for all of us. And everybody was happy, because they all knew it really meant getting rid of all these black people that we really don't like that much. They get on our nerves. There are people that we don't like to see. They haven't actually committed a crime, but they have the crime theory, OK? And so, and they look like criminals, and they, they get on our nerves, they wash the windows of the car, and we're tired of these people, we don't like them. We want to have urban camping laws too, because we're tired of these homeless people being all in these little parks that we want to have fun in. And so let's criminalize homelessness while we're at it, and just people looking bad on the streets, because it's the broken windows theory, you say that? And it's not really crime, but we're gonna create some laws to get rid of the nastiness of all these unpleasant people that we have to look at every day and get New York back to what it really needs to be. And that became the theory that really there's nothing wrong with America. These people have made bad decisions. They're lazy, trifling, no good, don't want to work. And so we're tired of that. There's their choices. They have opportunities for jobs. What's wrong with them? We're going to have to help them. And Clinton said, I'm going to help you black people to get over your criminal inclinations. I'm going to give you the three strikes crime bill in 1994. And we're going to start locking up everybody for all these career criminals, none of them being my friends because they get pardoned later. But let's just talk about, let's talk about this guy selling this crack on the street. That's your problem. I thought that guy was in the conference that was selling. Oh, that was the guy that gave him the dope. I forgot about that. So said, That's your problem, black people. You are you crackheads. You don't want to take care of your children. So I want to give you the three strikes crime bill and black people, especially the Congressional Black Caucus, which I suggest needs to be disbanded, um, the Congressional Black Caucus led the way and said, you know what, he's right. Master Clinton is right. We bad. We got to be corrected. We got to go to prison. <laughs> the prison population in America doubled between 1994 and 2004. Doubled. And of course, we know now that we have the highest incarceration rate and the highest number of people incarcerated in the world including places like China, where we're always concerned about their human rights violations, <laughs> including places like Rwanda, you know, <laughs> all that. So that's what Clinton did. And so he invented this notion, or he introduced for me, you know, in a wide way, in a widespread way, this idea that we now don't have to be responsible for the problems facing black people. We can let that go. It's their fault. The reason that black people have these problems, they're criminals. We, people even did a study on whether or not they had, there was such a thing as a criminal gene. You know, there's some people, I bet you, in this room wondering if there might be, be a criminal gene. But let's look at it this way. Crime is a political question, 
And it's not a genetic question. The behavior, this is not, we don't even have an, an idea about behaviors and so forth and so on. Although we did have those people that wrote that wonderful book called The Bell Curve in 1994. And they suggested that there was a, in, in, a genetic intelligence. People, you remember people started studying uh, um, Einstein's brain to put the brain in the jar for a year, for decades. They were like, is it, if it's, wait, what is about this little part? If it's big over here, does that mean, it's like, are you insane? <laughs> you know, you know, this stuff isn't genetic. And the Human Genome Project certainly bore that out, just like race isn't genetic. There's no such thing as race, you know, genetically speaking, or scientifically speaking, that would be. So there's certainly not going to be any such thing as uh, genetic criminal behavior. Is there something wrong with that person? They have an inclination to be a criminal? Stop yourself. Don't go crazy. Crime is a political question. And the reason that we know crime is a political question is because we can kill with impunity in this country, can't we? So we know it's not, murder is not a crime. It's only a crime under certain circumstances, isn't it? For example, somebody comes into your house, you got a gun. Everybody in America got guns. It's disgusting. You know, I lived in France. You know how hard it is to get a handgun in France? It's so hard to get a handgun. You might as well be the FBI to get a handgun in France. <laughs> you cannot get a handgun in France. You just can't. People don't go around strapped all day long. You know? <laughs> but anyway, so, so, so Clinton's whole, um, whole point is that, that um, we're going to do something. So this, this whole question of crime and criminalizing people and saying there must be something wrong with you. And so that becomes a new age racism. I'm not saying that there are not a lot of problems among black people, but there must be something wrong with black people. Look at you. And so people started saying that. And so when we look at crime and you talk about murder as a crime, well, somebody comes into your house, you get your gun, and you blow them away. You're not going to prison for that. It's called self-defense. It's a complete defense under the criminal laws of America. It's not very complicated. If you go to Iraq and kill some people, you're going to get a reward for that and an award for it. Huh? Nobody's going to tell you. If you're Colin Powell, I like to tell this story, so you have to pardon me. <laughs> it's one of my favorite thoughts. Not really, but if you're Colin Powell and George Bush I says, you know what, Colin, we got to go down there. I want you to go down there to uh, Panama, and I want you to arrest Manuel Noriega. He used to be my friend. It's true. And he was on the CIA payroll since 1955. But, and he's been drug trafficking. Everybody knows that. So, but he's a drug trafficker because I'm pissed off with him now, and I want him to be arrested. <laughs> Wait a minute. Isn't this a country? you just going into somebody's country, arresting the head of the country? That's called war, you know? So... Uh, <laughs> So he said, go down there. Colin Powell says, yes, sir, Mr. Bush. <laughs> so, anyway, he goes down to Panama, takes Black Hawk helicopters, got all kinds of troops, tanks on the ground. You know, Noriega was a general, right? He, and he knew how to fight, and they knew he did because they trained him at Fort Benning, right? You didn't know that one, did you? <laughs> so here comes Noriega. So Noriega moved to the left. And he moved to the right, and they couldn't get him. He finally realized he was surrounded. So he jumped in the church, and they said, well, we can't bomb the church, you know. Of course, had it been a mosque, that might have been a different story, huh? <laughs> but we can't bomb the church. So they didn't bomb the church. Noriega came out with a flag, and they arrested him. He's put in prison in Florida. You know, he's there right now as we speak, about to get out. He's on parole, facing, I mean, it's amazing to me. And so Noriega gets arrested, but in the process, about 5,000 Panamanians got killed. Nobody even remembers this. They're like, who are these people? We didn't know anything about this. Just kills people in the street. These were civilians. They weren't raising arms against Americans. We didn't have a battle going with uh, Panama, except the fact that Noriega was, a, was getting on, what's his name's nerves, on Bush's nerves. And so, so, so somebody asked Colin Powell, said, don't you feel that you used excessive force? <laughs> 5,000 people, you know, for one guy, that's a bit much, don't you think? You brought in all the helicopters and, you know, you strafed all the streets and all this stuff. He said, look, I don't deal with numbers, I deal with results. And nobody said Colin Powell was a mass murderer, did they? Matter of fact, he gets the cover of Ebony Magazine <laughs> every so often because Negroes love Colin Powell. He's a, look, he's an example and a model for all of us, you know. <laughs> we just don't even want to talk about the reality of who Colin Powell is, do we? We like the way he speaks. He's, he's articulate. He's not embarrassing. <laughs> he's articulate. Actually, he's not as articulate as one would think. But anyway, 
So let's look at the status of blacks today. And, and I use this as a measure because this begins to be, because there's poverty and everything, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, but I want to just focus a little bit on the black community because it's the clearest example. It's the easiest one to see. We got two million people in prison in America, and half of them are black. Half of them are black. However, I would like to ask a question in this audience. How many people in this audience know somebody who is or has been in prison? Doesn't that shock you? That's, that's more than half the people in the room, isn't it? And this is Vermont. Wait. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is not like the murder capital of America. That's called Philadelphia, where I'm from. They now call it Philadelphia. I'm serious. Black people have the highest poverty rates, lowest employment, highest unemployment, all of it, highest homelessness rates. Of course, we have an infant mortality rate that's double that of white children. Our cancer death rate, black women are dying of, uh, of uh, breast cancer at double the rates of white women and black men of prostate cancer at double the, rights, double the rate of white men. 65% of the women and children with AIDS are black. We have the lowest education levels and less than 1% of all business revenues in America come from black owned businesses. So we have to ask the question, is Clinton right? Is the reason that we have this status at this point in life because there's something wrong with us? <laughs> you know, we have, we have some kind of genetic flaw, you know? What's wrong with black people? Why don't you get some jobs and stop being so lazy and trifling and doing all these terrible things that you're doing? And so we have to take a look at the history, and that's what I want to talk about very briefly. I want to mention something else about looking at this history, because sometimes people's eyes glaze over, and they're like, do we have to go over this again? <laughs> yeah, we got to go over until we, until we get it right and get, and get what, the, what the real drill is. You know, I lived in France for, as I mentioned, and uh, I was there in 1994 when a guy named Paul Trouvier was put on trial. He was a member of the hierarchy of the Vichy government, you know, which was a, some people don't even know what the Vichy government is, which is so sad. What kind of a country? We don't even teach anything anymore, do we? The Vichy government, of course, was that collaborationist government with uh, the Nazis, and they were responsible for the uh, murders and uh, sending many hundreds of thousands of French Jews to the, to the uh, death camps, just get on, put them on the trains and send them right into Germany or to uh, Poland or wherever. And uh, Tuvier was a big part of that. He was actually second only to Klaus Barbie, who was known as the Butcher of Lyon. And uh, when he was put on trial, he was like 90 years old. Somebody found him in Bordeaux, living a comfortable life, <laughs> drinking wine and everything. And so the French were very upset because they were very, you know, they were always ambivalent about what their real role was. You know, they always try to tell you about the French underground and resistance. It really wasn't that much. But they took some hard hits from the Nazis. You know, the, the Germans wiped out almost the north of France before they finally capitulated and then they created this horrible Vichy government. But in any case, nobody wanted to talk about that little period of life. And the French you know, editorials rose up and people rose. They said, why are we talking about this? This man is old, the war is over, we gotta move on. Let's just go forward, let's turn the page of history. You know how we say here, get over it. <laughs> And so the French prosecutor said something I love to quote, and he said, you know, it's true, we must turn the page of history, but in order for us to turn the page, we have to write the page. Now, we have not written that page in the history of this country about what happened to black people, not to count the natives, not to count a whole bunch of other people. Well, we'll get into that in a minute, but I just want to remind us about the history of black people in this country because we are a significant segment of this country that is incredibly large portion, of, largest portion of whom are living in an oppressed state in this country. We know that black people didn't come here looking for religious freedom or a better life. <laughs> you, know, you know, you talk about the Mexicans. You know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm just so, I gotta say this stuff. You know, I'm so irritated by these Lou Dobbs people. Was he leading a movement now in Lou Dobbs? It's Lou Dobbs, the illegal immigrants, like Lou Dobbs got here legally. <laughs> Nobody came from Europe illegally. What, the native people invited you here? They said, come on, please, here's some paperwork. Can you fill it out? <laughs> Came in here ripping up stuff and killing people and everything, and sitting up here talking about, and then, and then the next big wave that came in the late 1800s, that came, you know, Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, huddled masses, come on down and get a job in the industrial fields, right? That's what the idea was. It was come on and get a job. Come on from Ireland and whatever. We're not gonna try to remember your name and we're really not checking too much. <laughs> Most of these people don't even know what their names were. 
Somebody wrote another name down there like, well, I think our name used to be this, but now it's just, it used to be Kaczynski, but now it's just, uh, you know, Cake or something. I mean, that's a dumb name, but anyway, you get, you get the point. So, so this business of the Mexicans being illegal, because nobody's asking anything about any illegal French. You know nobody's thinking about French people when they're talking about illegal immigration. Not talking about any English people. And I, I know a lot of French people in this country illegally. They don't even have a piece of paper. Just been here, don't even speak English. <laughs> been here for 40 years, don't even speak English. I'm serious, I really know people like this. And so, uh, so, so we, I'm upset about this business because it's racist. It's really about some racism. And the other thing it's about is that, the, the, what are they doing? The same thing the Europeans did, trying to find a way to make a living. It's all trying to live every day. People have all these solutions. Let's close the border. What do you mean? You close the border. I say open them all up. I don't care who comes here because whosoever will, let him come on. I'm not mad at anybody because I don't own this country. And nobody in here owns this country. There were some people here when we got here, right? <laughs> but we, we put them on reservations and we don't want to think about them either. That's just like the history of black people or the history of the Vichy government, huh? So we're going to talk a little bit about that history because by the time you get to 1776 in this country and the actual country is formed, black people have been enslaved for 150 years. So you have to realize the most key, the key thing for me is the country was founded as a slave-holding nation. That's an embarrassment, isn't it? You know, I live in Georgia, and you know, people who don't live in the South always think, you know, the South, how can you live in the South? You know, how can you live there? There's so much racism. And, and they have the Confederate flag. It's embarrassing. It's disgusting. I'm not worried about the Confederate flag. The flag of the United States of America was the flag of a slave-holding nation. The Confederate flag didn't come up for quite a while after that. <laughs> so I don't see much of a real difference for me. You know, I'm not, I'm not into the Barack Obama, uh, let, we're red state, blue state, we're all, you know, whatever. So I'm saying this, this was a country formed as a slaveholding nation. And what was important about it is that the people who were slaves were Africans or black or their descendants. And so when Thomas Jefferson, you know, wrote the little declaration, well, he's, he's given credit for writing the Declaration of Independence, you know, and then talks about the basic philosophy, the Enlightenment philosophy about all men are created equal. And so he was a Francophile, and the French started asking him, well, how can you talk about all men are created equal when, you, when you're holding slaves? Not just you, Thomas Jefferson, but everybody signed the Declaration of Independence, signed the Constitution just about. You know, we the people were only like those guys that signed. It was a contract among them, right? <laughs> if you weren't a white male, Anglo-Saxon Protestant landholder, you really weren't in the all men are created equal part. So that cut out a whole lot of people right away. But you know it didn't mean blacks, and, and slavery was legal, and the only reference to black people in the Constitution was that we could be counted as three-fifths of a man. Now that didn't mean we were valued as three-fifths of a man, our value was that we were chattel. We were not even human beings. And Thomas Jefferson said, well, the reason that we, people ask, well, why don't we have the blacks in, in Notes on the State of Virginia, the only book he ever wrote? He says, why can't we bring the blacks into this experiment of all men are created equal in this enlightened society? He said, well, there are differences. There are differences. We got to look at these differences. Look at their skin. That immovable veil of black. It's not beautiful. Like the admixture of red and white among the whites. And what about their, uh, and these are the words he uses, black and white. And what about their hair? It's not long and flowing like our hair. And what about their skin? They, they, they have a disagreeable odor. And, what, and they're lazy. And they lust after their women. And they have no art or music or literature in them. And he says, I advance it, therefore, that the black is inferior to the white in the endowments of both body and mind. So we can't. I'm not going to give up my slaves was the point, you see, because I got money coming in because the South Carolina rice planters are getting ready to be the richest men in the world. We're not trying to give up on those slavery. So the only way we can justify that is to say they're not human. So they're not human. So it's a genetic problem. In other words, if they were just, and he says, you know, we can see an improvement in the black with one pass of white blood. Of course, we know who he was talking about with uh, Sally Hemmings and all that rape he was silently, secretly committing down there at Monticello that William Jefferson Clinton loved so much, you know. So, uh, yeah, Monticello, he was a rapist, and, I mean, uh, Jefferson at Monticello. So by 1861, you know, the South Carolina rice planters, the Georgia cotton farm, these boys were making money. And they were like, everything's going along okay. 
What's the problem? Well, it was a rise of industrialization. You can make more widgets, make more money. The market can get bigger, expand. We got to expand the market. We got to go into other areas. We can't drag this old stuff the same way we are now. We're at that same point, aren't we, in America? You know, people think they're going to get that little industrial job. You know, I told this story earlier today. You know, remember when Timothy McVeigh came home from Iraq and went to Buffalo? <laughs> You know, Buffalo is really a sad little town, but it's like a lot of little towns. You know, they all had little, little industrial uh, bases. And Tim went home to Buffalo and said, where's my job? They said, Tim, there ain't been a job in Buffalo since the deer hunter. What are you talking about? <laughs> and there's not going to be one either. <laughs> and not for you, you're unskilled. <laughs> we, might, we might call in some other people, but it won't be you, Tim. Tim said, what? I was a tank commander. I went into Iraq, I gave my life. I killed people for you, because we forgot people got killed in the first Gulf War. I killed for you, where's my job? I said, Tim, there's no job for you. Your job was to kill. It's the only job we got for you, Tim. And that's what's happening in the entire country right now. So we're in that shifting moment, aren't we? No more industrial, no point in you studying and thinking that you're going to develop a steel, get a job in the steel mill, because <laughs> it's not going to happen. You better get some computer skills, and you better figure out how you're going to sell Coca-Cola in Africa or something, you know, because that's what that's, this is about. So the same tension arose between the so-called North and South, and Lincoln said, well, we can't have this, and so forth and so on, and South said, well, we're seceding. And those states seceded and created the Confederate States of America, and they elected a president. His name was Jefferson Davis. <laughs> But Lincoln said, wait a minute, the South started winning the war. Lincoln's like, wait a minute, what am I going to do? I have to stop this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to free the slaves in the seceding states, meaning I'm going to undercut the labor base that they have that's keeping Tara going. <laughs> you know, Tara is like, Scarlet's down there by herself, but she got some slaves. They're making, you know, they're providing food for us. And so that did turn the tide of war. And by 1865, of course, um, the war was over. The North had won. The Union had won. And um, Sherman had just about burnt everything, as he said, to the sea. And at the same time, he issued something called Field Order Number 15, in which he said that he wanted to make sure that all the lands that he had just uh, confiscated, the southern, big southern lands, he wanted them to be distributed and divided up into 40-acre plots and distributed to the black families as uh, the form that we would now soon be not slaves, so they would have some place to to eat. Now, it's not that Sherman liked black people or he was some heroic figure. They let's not get too excited about it. But, but he knew that you had to do something with these uh, four or five million people. Otherwise, they'd just be running around here buck crazy, you see. So Sherman said, you got to give them some way to live. Andrew Johnson, the new president after Lincoln was killed, said, you must be kidding. I know you're not talking about getting on these good white people's land. You better get off this land by December or I'm going to send the army in there to move you out. Because many blacks did run and get these little 40 acres. Matter of fact, there's some in Georgia right now still got their little certificates. It's amazing. It's quite interesting. At the same time the 13th Amendment was passed abolishing slavery, the black codes were instituted in the South because the majority of blacks lived in the South, and the black codes governed black life. And what did the black codes tell us? They told us that there are many things that blacks could do wrong and not much we could do right. But one of them was that uh, we had to have a job. We had to have employment. If a black man wasn't employed, then it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, a, it was a crime punishable by time on the chain gangs <laughs> so you could work for free and build some of these railroads. You follow me? And so that, that became, and then there was a the rise of the KKK and uh, all of this. And, and so at that point, even though we had the abolition of slavery, the status of blacks did not change meaningfully because most people went back to working for the people they had worked for to help build up the new South in the reconstruction, right? didn't own any 40 acres, gone. Everybody still, black people still running around here waiting for 40, 40 acres. Some of them just looking for a mule, you know, 40 <laughs> acres and a mule. So by the, toward the end of the year, we had all these Europeans starting to come, end of the century rather, all these Europeans starting to come in from all over. Lincoln was very involved in that process because he knew we, that the country needed workers, industrial workers, and they were not trying to have all these black people overwhelm the industrial fields. And so they needed to bring some white people. And this is the truth. And so you had Irish and all these people, they were fighting among themselves all the time. You know, you've seen the gangs in New York and all that kind of stuff, you know. New York went from like five people to a million people in one year, you know, it was ridiculous. And so, and they're all crowded in and speaking different languages, but the one thing they realized was when it came to black people trying to come up there and get those jobs, everybody became white. That's how you have white people in America. 
People really weren't white. They were actually Irish and Scottish, but we don't have all that. We don't worry about those details anymore. People are white, black, and other. And those who are not white are trying to crowd into other, trust me. <laughs> I'm part Filipino. <laughs> okay, fine. You're black in most places, but because black is really not a color question, it's a, it's a social economic question. So now, we, we come to 1896 in the great case of Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy was a light-skinned Negro, tried to get on a train, in a segregated train in, in Louisiana. Louisiana law allowed for segregation of trains. The white train cars were beautifully appointed and the black ones were, had nothing, but they were paying the same price. So Plessy tried to get on the train. Actually, he tried to pass, <laughs> but he got caught. And uh, so he, well, he, he didn't quite try to pass, but he got onto the white car and they put him off and he sued and went to the United States Supreme Court and, and uh, Plessy said, you know, I shouldn't even have to sit in the black car because I'm mostly white. I'm an octoroon, <laughs> which I find to be humorous. I'm an octoroon. That means I'm one eighth black. I'm more white than black, so I should be with the whites. Why should I sit back there with the blacks? And the court said, we are declaring you to be black, Plessy. <laughs> so I hope you have something else to say. And he said, well, I do, I'm a citizen. And I have a right to sit in a beautiful car. Why should I pay the same thing? I'm a citizen. Of course, that's not a citizenship right, Plessy. That's, that's, not, that's a social question. People can't get along with that. We can't make good white people who just yesterday saw you as a slave and now you have to sit next to them. We, we can't socially engineer America. This is a legal question. And the only thing we'll say is that as long as the cars are equal, the accommodations are equal, they can be separate, right? And we have the rule of fresh, Plessy, which is separate but equal, which of course gave us the rise of Jim Crow or the existence of American apartheid, huh? And so you know the condition of blacks is now going down further. Because if you don't own the train cars and you gotta beg someone else to get on the train, that's one thing. But if you don't have a hospital and you gotta beg to get a, a bed in the hospital and they're not letting you in because they're not gonna let any white nurses touch any black bodies, and if you have to beg to go to school or get housing, or get food, get a job, you have a big problem, don't you? And so people fought. Booker T. Washington said, look, I'm not going to try to marry your wife and integrate with you. Just give us some money and let us develop our own thing. People poured money into, into the Tuskegee machine, as it was called. And then you had the integration. It's the Du Bois and the NAACP saying, look, let's just, we need to be with white people and just improve ourselves. And then you had, of course, the great migrations, people looking for jobs coming from the south to the north, and you had Garvey, Marcus Garvey, talking about independent black economy. And then you had the people trying to form some kind of uh, unions because we were shut out of the unions by all the new European immigrants. So we, we'll fight each other, but we're not gonna let any black people come into these unions. And this was some of the most progressive people at, at that during the whole union movement. We had uh, the Nation of Islam talking about independent uh, economies during this period as the turn of the century getting into the first couple of decades. Uh, we had campaigns, don't buy where you can't work. The second great mi migration came and nothing changed for blacks. And then we saw some hope. Jackie Robinson got hired you know, in the Brooklyn Dodge. We said, look, it's a new day. World War II is over. We fought Tuskegee Airmen. We fought just like white men did. We fought for this country. We fought Hitler. So we know now we're finally going to get our share, whatever that meant. And it didn't really happen, did it? Nothing really happened. Because after Jackie Robinson uh, got hired by the Dodgers and a few more of the Negro Leagues broke down and that was kind of the end of that. Matter of fact, now we can hardly find any black people play, playing baseball anymore unless they're coming from the Dominican Republic or somewhere. <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> and then so we, we spent decades trying to find a way to get food and housing and clothing, housing and clothing and education and all these things. And by 1954, the little Linda Brown's father said, separate is not equal in the public education system and the Supreme Court of the United States said, you're right, we're going to desegregate the schools. It's illegal to have separate, separate schools. You know there was some gnashing of teeth then. People went buck crazy. People started fighting. You had to send in troops to get little Arthurine loose. You've seen the, John, the Norman Rockwell painting where little Ruby Bridges is trying to go to school and they got to have 10,000 troops just to take one little black child to school. The Little Rock Nine, all of that. There's many, many stories of bloodshed for black folks just to try to get into these white schools thinking that actually, and rather mistakenly many times, that white people had the secret and that the secret was in education some kind of way. You know, it's like fighting for the right to go to South Boston High, huh? Anyway, uh, <laughs> I could never figure that one out. 
But by 1955, Rosa Parks, the great Rosa Parks, does that wonderful moment when we all love to talk about, you know, she wouldn't give up her seat on the bus, just like Plessy, just wanted a seat. Paid the price, won a seat. Sixty-some years later, here comes a whole battle about whether or not a black woman can have a seat on a bus. And then we get the voice of Dr. King, which was wonderful, of course, giving us the moral question of saying, wait a minute, you have a promise that you haven't fulfilled about equality here. What are you doing? And then, of course, by that time, Dr. King's voice was so loud, it rises up in 1963 at the March on Washington, and then he does talk about a promissory note. And so finally we get, by the time he, he marches on Washington, uh, Kennedy, of course, was there and wouldn't meet with him. You know, people tell him, John Kennedy, I'm not trying to get into a whole thing about John because I don't really care that much right now, but I'm saying that John Kennedy uh, wouldn't meet with King, you know, but, 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 but his successor, if you can call him that, uh, didn't mind meeting with King now that he was the president. And so he gave King the 64, 64 Civil Rights Acts and the 65 Voting Rights Acts. He didn't give it to King, but that's what he thought. That was the, that was the trade off and the poverty program, huh? And so while he was invading the Gulf of Tonkin, get ready to kill half the world, Johnson gave black people the Civil Rights Act and the 65 Voting Rights Act, written by Bobby Kennedy as the Attorney General and so forth. And, uh, and the country was like, well, everything's over now. Everything's OK. <laughs> you know, that's why Clinton could say, Martin Luther King died for your freedom, because it was over. But Dr. King himself said, wait a minute. We have the civil rights. It took us 100 years to be able to have, say we can sit in the same accommodations with white. It took us 100 years from 1865 to 1965 to get our voting rights secured. But what the heck? We got them now. Now we can vote. <laughs> you know, don't have any land, don't have anything else, but we do have the vote. And we can choose what white man is going to run our lives this next four years. <laughs> and, so, and so Dr. King says, but when I look out at this country, I see that we've gotten uh, the 64 and 65 uh, acts going. He said, but where do we go from here? And if, in order for us to know where we go from here, we have to know where we are. And where we are, I see, is that what black people have is half of what is good in America and double of what is bad. That's what Dr. King said. We forget a lot of stuff he said, but that's another story. People just pick and choose and, you know, flip it the way they want. What is it? We do with everything. But by 1966, people were talking about black power. We wanted something more than civil rights. We wanted our human rights, we said. We wanted power. We wanted black power. And some people didn't know what it was, including the people uh, in the Black Panther Party, who, which ultimately formed in that year. But we knew we wanted it. <laughs> and so we wanted it. And we said we wanted to, to, to fight hard to get our, our human rights. That we wanted, the first point of the Black Panther Party program was we want freedom. We want freedom, we want the power to determine the destiny of our black communities. We want food, clothing, housing, justice, and peace. We understood what we wanted, and then we said, how are we going to get it? So we developed a number of strategies, and the biggest, I, and the biggest ideology or the biggest, the biggest strategy or the biggest goal that we had is that we knew we could not be free in the same paradigm that had oppressed us. If the construct remains the same, then we're going to remain in the same situation. So we had to talk about revolutionary change. And we had to talk about ending the end of capitalism and exploit, human exploitation. So that's what we had to talk about. We weren't talking about building a nation inside of this country and becoming little black capitalists running around somehow. We didn't even know how that was going to work out and what we weren't talking about it anyway. And so one of the strategies we had was to organize black people around their interests. Because we said, if, you, if, if, there, if food costs money and you need food to live, there's a price on your head. Because if you don't have any money, you will drop dead in America. We're not thinking about feeding people here. And so we said, well, in order for people to understand that they have a right to eat, uh -huh, then we're going to feed children for free. And we did. We started our free breakfast for children. We did all these other things. Of course, the first thing we did was we said, we don't want to have police brutality in our communities. We still have all these shootings going on, Sean Bell in New York and all the So Huey Newton says, and we're not taking any pictures. We're not, the revolution is not going to be YouTubed and emailed, OK? <laughs> He said, we're going into the street with some shotguns, the same guns that the police have. And we're going to stand on the corners and make sure that they recognize that they cannot come into these communities and murder our people or there will be consequences.
And we said, how can we talk about the freedom of black people when Chicanos, Mexicans in the, uh, work in the fields of California like we work the fields of Alabama? How can we talk about our freedom in the context of their oppression? And we said, we can. And so we, we actually helped to form and then formed a coalition with the Brown Berets. And I'm proud to say I was there that night when we joined hands of Brown Berets in December of 1968. And then we said, what about the Puerto Ricans working the sweatshops of New York, Chicago, and everywhere else? We said, how can we talk about our freedom in the context of that? We said, we can't. So we formed a coalition with the young lords. What about poor whites running up and down Appalachian, running into Chicago just like we did, thinking that there was some hope in some other city, running here, running there, trying to find food, like, like dogs, not having anywhere to go? We said, we can't. So we, we created and formed a coalition with the Young Patriot Party in Chicago, led by a brother named Slim Coleman. I always say they were kind of like the left-leaning versions of, of Timothy McVeigh. This wasn't the SDS, you get my drift? So we said, what about the Chinese that built half these, some of these railroads here? And we had the Red Guard coalition. What about the, half the country that's oppressed? That would be women. And we said, we were the only black organization that said women's liberation is a part of our struggle. What about gays? They're walking around here being crushed aside too. And wait a minute, people got nervous when we said that. But Huey, New <laughs> Huey Newton issued an edict and said in 1970 that gay liberation is a part of our struggle. We were the only black organization that said that. It said, what about the people locked in wheelchairs and can't get anywhere and being shuffled aside like they don't exist anymore? And we said, we can't talk about our freedom in the context of their oppression, so we formed a coalition with the Center for Independent Living with some crazy, radical, uh, upper body built up, quiet, paraplegia that could roll up that thing, you know. We'd come into a building and knock stuff down. Oh, you don't want to have access for wheelchairs? That's fine, we're gonna just roll on. And they, and they, they did it, you know. <laughs> they didn't play. And what about the environment? Are we escaping pollution because of melanin? <laughs> so we said, <laughs> we cannot allow the world to be polluted by all this industrial waste. And we formed a coalition with the Trust for Public Land and created a program called the Gardens in the Ghetto. Yes, we did. And we, and we created Gardens in the Ghetto too. Gardens in the Ghetto. And what about our brothers and sisters in South Africa? who have under, under the boot of apartheid in South Africa. We said we can't talk about ourselves in the context of their oppression. So we said we formed a coalition. And these were real. These were not fake coalitions, just lip service. We did real things together with the, P, with the, uh, the uh, PAC, the Pan-Africanist Congress. And what about the Vietnamese now suffering under the war? We didn't just say we want to end to the war. We said these are our friends and our comrades. They're fighting for liberation just like we are. And so we didn't just call for peace in Vietnam, we called for victory for the Viet Cong. John McCain, listen to that one. <laughs> and, what about, and what about our other friends in Africa in Zimbabwe? We formed a coalition with ZANU in Zimbabwe and Frelimo in, uh, in Mozambique. And what about some of our other friends who are in Europe? We said, what about the Irish in Northern Ireland trying to fight for their liberation and independence? We said we formed a coalition with the IRA. You know, that got scary, didn't it? <laughs> People are like, what? The IRA? Yes. <laughs> and we put money into the Bernadette Devlin campaign and became who became the first Sinn Féin representative uh, in, the, in the parliament, okay? And our friends and comrades all over the world, we said, we, their struggle is our struggle, and our struggle is their struggle. And we cannot ever rest as long as anyone is oppressed in this world and think that we're going to have freedom any, at any time. And we meant that. Unlike most others, we really meant it. And we did hold hands with everybody. And we created the so-called Rainbow Coalitions. Not the Jesse Jackson fake whatever that is, but Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton, the head of our party in Chicago and in Illinois, talked about you know, black power for black people, yellow power for yellow people, red power for red people. And we even said white power for white people. People said, wait a minute, are you Nazis? I mean, are you crazy? He said, no, we're talking about all people being human beings. And we meant it, and we, and we delivered on it. But change didn't come for black people as a result of any of our efforts. The FBI certainly put it on us. We, t we struggled, and we can talk about that if you want to. But the bottom line was that the status of black people did not effectively change in any meaningful way, even after the Black Panther Party's magnificent efforts. So I think what we have to do is, the first thing we have to do is recognize there is a problem here that needs to be resolved, and we can see it clearer through black people. But we can understand that that, that, that happens to a lot of people. I'm looking at the paper here, looking at all the poverty right here in Vermont. Right? And it's hard to get past poverty in places like Vermont, cold as it is, cold as it is. You know, if you're living in the South, you might do a little better. You know, you don't need shoes in the South. You can, you can make it with a few little Walmart uh, scuffies, you know what I'm saying? But that's going to be rough up here, you know what I'm saying?
So we have to reckon with our past, the way the Germans, the Germans at least acknowledge the Holocaust, okay? Everybody else might not, but the Germans have. And they, the Americans can't even acknowledge and apologize for slavery. Can't even say, not even a little teeny plaque, sorry. <laughs> the U.S. apologized to the Japanese for putting them in the internment camps and to the Hawaiians for ripping off Hawaii, though they have not returned it, I noticed. <laughs> So we have to make a decision about what kind of society we want and look at what society that we actually have. Do we want mass incarceration to be the rule of law in this country, where we just incarcerate everybody? Do we want our taxes spent on weapons of mass destruction used against all kinds of people, innocent people in this world for profit of a few? Do we really want a country in which poverty and racism in fact abound and it cannot be erased by Barack Obama or his mama? Where profit is more important than life or liberty? And that's what we have right now. And unless we reckon with that and understand that we won't make any change. So the real change we have to look at, I think, at this point, when we're talking about this change at this point, is let's talk about some kind of what we call fundamental change or some, people, some of us call revolutionary change. I don't advocate that everybody has to be a revolutionary, but you have to know that as long as this country exists in the manner in which it exists, you are going to continue to have the masses of our of people in this country living in the levels of we are thinking that we're going to get another little job and just be enough, and figure out how we're going to make more money, not even recognizing that our, the money that we might make here might affect some other people somewhere else in a very negative way. So I argue that this society must be transformed transformed to a more enlightened one, where we don't have poverty, where we don't have racism, where we're not waging wars of aggression, where profit is not valued over human life. And so that it might come from the ballot, it might come from the bullet, as Malcolm X talked about. But if we want some change, you know we're going to have to do one thing. We are going to have to fight for it. Thank you very much.